I will tell you, I know there's a large portion of this room that's either diabetic or pre-diabetic, some that have been recently diagnosed, some that have been um, diagnosed and been med on medication for a long time. Um, in America, statistically, if you're over 35, um, there's a 50% chance you're at least pre-diabetic, which is kind of scary to think about. Um, but also, you know, just as much about having the right information, because I will tell you there's, there's multiple studies, and I'll, I'll show you several of them, that have shown that for 100% of those test groups, that when they follow the right things, they've, they've reversed their type 2. And when I say reverse, I'm not saying their blood sugar is perfect, but what I will say is they've been able to get off the medications they're on, their blood sugar is more manageable. Now again, these are smaller studies for whatever reason, um, but it's one of those things where it's not like this happens for some people, but it does take effort, consistency, knowledge. The second thing that I'd like to um, hopefully have you leave here um, with tonight is, the, is knowing the difference between treating a disease, which means trying to manage it and or reverse it, versus changing the number of a disease. Does everybody know what difference what I mean by that? When you talk about changing the number, changing the number is looking at it from a, well, my numbers are good, but I still have the problem. And that's often what's done um, with medication, is treating the number to, to save the extreme examples. But as you'll see, is that um, some of these things, um, some of these things will actually, uh, they're, they're, they cause just as much problem or they cause a different problem. So let's get into that just a little bit. Um, as everybody knows, when you talk about type 2 diabetes, it's re related to blood sugar numbers, but also insulin, and, and just as important is the idea of insulin resistance. So insulin is the hormone that's released for your body to absorb sugar out of your blood into your cells. Insulin resistance, and everybody has a certain amount of insulin resistance, but insulin resistance is how much your body resists accepting the sugar into the cell or how much insulin it takes in your blood to accomplish um, getting your body to accept or receive it. Now, when you talk about numbers, as you know, diabetes numbers are rising. Um, what a lot of people don't realize, 30% of all um, death certificates or heart disease death certificates have diabetes listed as a direct link for um, causing or, or being linked to the, the heart attack itself or the stroke. Um, it's, it's also linked to uh, lifestyle significantly and um, as you can see and as I think everybody knows associated with body weight. Now here's one of the reasons why I want to talk about treating the number for just a second. Let's take the most basic form of of diabetes treatment, which would be if, you're, if your blood sugar is high enough, for the majority of people, the first thing that they do is they get um, or prescribed metformin. They, everybody heard of the term metformin? Some people are on. Metformin is, is for most people the first drug um, prescribed when your blood sugar starts to get a little bit high. Now, if you read about it, I, I had a very interesting conversation with um, one of the, the uh, medical doctors that comes in to see us because she said she's an integrative medical doctor, meaning that she tries to do natural first and then um, prescribes medication if need be. And what she said was, if you read, she was diagnosed with as pre-diabetic um, at a young age. If you read the literature, it, it literally says in the, for the doctor's insert for metformin will lead to need for insulin use over time or expected to, ex I shouldn't say will, it says expected to lead to. Now, if, you, if your body gets, so what metformin does is it increases your body's sensitivity to insulin. Now, if it, as your body gets more and more sensitive, um, because of the drug, your, the cells itself become more resistant, and once you start to wear out the pancreas or you start to wear out the organs that are making the insulin, um, then what, what inevitably happens is you have to put insulin in from the outside to then make your body, have your body have enough insulin to get your blood sugar lower. Now, when you just saw these charts, you see the charts for um, obesity increasing from 1994 to 2015. So over the last 20 years plus, um, obesity or weight rates increase. Well, actually, insulin is the hormone that tell, is one of the hormones that tells your body to retain body fat. So over time, the longer somebody consumes insulin or takes insulin, um, especially from an outside source, it actually tends to lead to weight gain. Weight gain leads to more insulin sensitivity, and everybody can see how this this um, 
spirals. So it spirals down. So when you look at it, that's what I'm talking about treating the number. It's to get the blood sugar down, but if you follow that path, the most basic, most common path for somebody that's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, if they just treat it medically, is to be dependent on insulin and have all the health problems and triggers. The side effects of the drug are the same reason that the, or the same risk factors are why somebody needs the, the drug. So it's not the best, in my opinion, not the best way to look at it. Um, the other thing is type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes. That has changed because um, it's happening to children younger and younger. In fact, if you just talk about sugar, um, sugar consumption per day is higher in, in adolescents or children 18 and younger than it is in adults 18 and older. So, more, so children are taking more sugar than adults and because of that and because of the increased amount of sugar consumption per child per day, um, type 2 diabetes is happening at younger and younger ages, which really means insulin resistance is occurring even in childhood. And yet you hear people say, well, their kids, they'll run it off, or their, right? Everybody heard somebody say that before. Um, so what the, what the video um, that was supposed to play um, talk, talked about specifically was um, they say that your, your insulin resistance starts more than 10 years before your pre-diabetic blood sugars go up. So the disease process was building at least 10 years before you ever could even see it on a test. At least 10 years. And for many people, they said it can be 20 or 30 years. So if you're diagnosed with this at, at 10 or 11 or 12 years old, think about when your insulin resistance would have started. When, you know, it's, it's a very young age. And, um, now, the, the, the shorter amount of time that you've been diagnosed with, typically the easier it is to reverse it. The other thing to talk about with, with insulin or with diabetes specifically is there are, um, and type 2 diabetes, it doesn't just affect your blood sugar, but it, it, it affects your heart, which most people know dramatically increases your risk of stroke. It also affects your brain. So insulin resistance specifically dramatically increases Alzheimer's risk, dementia risk, MS risk. Um, you, as, as I think many people know, you can, you can go blind, you can lose limbs. You can, it does a lot of damage to the arteries in your body. And all of this is related back to inflammation. Um, inflammation and um, damage to your detoxifying organs. And then neurologically, it damages your nerves, which is where you start to talk about neuropathies. Um, it also, somebody who's diabetic has almost twice the health care cost as somebody who's not. Now, I think everybody knows we're, we're responsible for our own health, but at the same time, um, if you're told, which I had somebody say to me today, they said, my doctor told me I'm just going to be on this for life, forever. So they were told that this is, they can't make the change, it doesn't matter what they do, and that's a pretty, in my opinion, a fairly defeating uh, mindset to be given. And so what I, what I want to see is it's, it's very changeable. So, Type, three types of diabetes, and the third one is kind of a theory at this point, but so type one, um, type one diabetes is an autoimmune condition. It's something that you develop, it's a genetically triggered turn on that they do not say can be reversed, or, or it can be managed so you can need less insulin, but essentially your body stops producing insulin and over time you have to, you have to either wear a pump or inject insulin um, into your body. Type 1 though has had a few triggers and one of the reasons why I want to talk about this is because for those of you with kids or even that um, are aunts, uncles, grandparents, whatever, three of the things that they've linked to the genetic expression or turning on type 1, one is, one is low vitamin D, so essentially being inside, not, not getting out or putting sunscreen on all the time so you never really get vitamin D from the sun. Um, one, it, one is um, toxicity, so consistent um, more consistent exposure to toxins, whether that's toxins in the chemicals and in foods and processed foods that are more and more prevalent for kids, um, but toxins in anywhere that they're exposed to toxicity. Soaps, laundry detergents, any of this stuff, the more toxic exposure, the more likely somebody is to turn on um, the gene. And then the last thing is just total inflammation. So total inflammation, whether it's whatever the source, whether it's from sugar, whether it's from you know, toxicity like we just talked about. But that's type one, and again, autoimmune. Type two is the one that's, again, most reversible because of all the things that we talked about. So we're gonna go more into type two in a minute. And then the type three, if you read, if you type in type three diabetes online, you won't see anything about um, your body. You'll see it's, all, it's related to your brain. So that what they've done is they're trying to separate insulin resistance is damage to your body and insulin resistance damage to your brain. So having high insulin resistance in your body and the increased inflammation, they've shown now 
Um, and the National Institute of Health has shown or, or agreed with that your body, um, your brain is sensitive to insulin and how much insulin you put in your body and how much insulin you produce. So if you eat whatever a big piece of chocolate cake every single day and you have this big insulin flush, um, you're more likely to have um, placking in your brain over time. So higher sugar consumption is also, it's not just affecting from here down, it's also why diabetes is linked to um, mental sluggishness. Not saying anybody with diabetes is mentally sluggish, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is over time, your risk increases that you're gonna have damage to your brain because it's, it's an inflammatory response. So that's why they separated it, calling it type three. Um, so again, it's, type two is not blood sugar problem, it's a problem with insulin resistance. Type 1 is an, an, a purely insulin problem. Your body doesn't make. Your body stops making it. Type 2, it's the resistance. So your body's producing so much that it's not letting the sugar out of your blood. So if we were going to draw this very simplistically, from a, if, you're, if this big... Oh, hold on. There we go. All right, so if we have this big cell... If you have insulin receptors, so meaning that it, when insulin comes up to this cell, if, if this little circle is insulin, when it comes up, it receives this and it makes a tunnel and it lets sugar out of your blood into your cell. That's how it works. So that's what insulin, that's what insulin does. It's the hormone that tells your cell to make a tunnel and allow the sugar in. What will happen is if, it, if you only needed one in, little piece of insulin um, to, to cause this initially, if you have too much sugar in your blood, you might, it might take three things of insulin to get this tube to open up because it's starting to get more and more resistant. Also, what will happen is you'll start to, over time, make less receptors per cell because it doesn't want to absorb as much of the sugar in. Because what happens if you force more sugar in than your body wants to accept? You gain Wait, it turns into fat, right? So it's forced in, it's converted into fat, so it's stored energy, but over time it's damaging to your body. And, and again, so why if you keep taking the insulin medication, does it cause a problem? Is if you keep taking more and more insulin to get the same result, think what that's doing to these cells that's damaging your body. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's what type two really is. So how do you make this better? You make your body need less insulin by putting less sugar in, and when you starve a cell, it's going to create, it's supply and demand, it's going to create more receptors because it doesn't have enough sugar to go around. And so the more receptors grab it and that's how your body can reverse it. If you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, um, most of these studies that, that well, I'll show you tonight say on average it takes eight weeks of being very strict, um, but it's possible to change, your, change it over within eight weeks. And you can see changes if you're testing your blood sugar in as early as one week. Now, these are a few of the numbers for the numbers people. We're not going to go over them a lot, but what's, what's diabetes really look like? It's, so the, the definition is if your fasting blood glucose, if you took the little meter, is over 125 fasting without food. Um, Pre-diabetic is 100 to 125. Normal is fasting is under 100. Now when they test for hormones, um, normal fasting insulin is 5, ideal is 3, meaning that you don't have a lot of insulin floating around in your blood. Um, leptin, which is your fat burning hormone that you can use for energy instead, um, is less than 10. Ideal is between 4 and 6. So again, these are blood test numbers. We're not going to go into them a lot, but if you're interested, that's, that's what you're looking at. Also, I do want to talk about a A1C. Um, A1C is, is a little bit, what they're trying to do with A1C is instead of saying, well, how is your sugar today? It's how is your sugar over the last three months? Now, this test works really well. Um, this test works better than just the daily. The problem that they're finding with this test is different people, different people have different lengths that their red blood cells live. And it also can depend on your health. So A1C is a, a measurement of um, how much sugar attaches to your blood cells over a three month period, assuming that your red blood cells die every three months. Um, so if you, if you have red blood cells that live four months, you're gonna have a higher A1C and not realize it. You know, and the test is going to show. So, so they're, they're starting to find that this isn't the most ideal test, but again, it's another test. There's no perfect test. Um, the, the best test, in my opinion, right now is, is a how fast does your blood sugar um, go down after you eat. So this is from, from the, the natural community of all the tests. So it, it's a blood sugar 
taking your blood sugar two hours after you eat and seeing what it goes down to. So that's it. All right, so here's, here's a couple of the things that I think is, um, is important to um, at least hear, you know, at least hear this. So um, doses increase over time because, again, going back to what we just talked about here with insulin, um, insulin therapy has an increased risk of a cancer rate. Um, also, incre incre when you take more insulin into your body, it increases cardiovascular um, risk events. So wait a minute, the whole problem with having high blood sugar is it causes heart heart disease. It causes, so, of course, if your blood sugar skyrockets and it goes to four, five, six hundred, it's going to put you in a coma immediately. But if you, if you have a higher blood sugar and it's not doing the extreme things, um, these are the risks. Well, the same risks occur, unfortunately, with the larger doses of medication. So what are you, what are you trading for? Now, the, the debate is, and this is where, whether we talk about statins for your cholesterol or um, insulin for your blood sugar, is by treating the number is it reducing your risk of the problem, of the real problem that's coming back to? Because they, it, from everything that I can read about it, they've actually shown that taking uh, the higher doses of the insulin to lower your, it can actually increase your risk of death versus un... Now again, um, why do we talk about that? Because the best way to treat it is to get less and less medication to get your body to do it itself. So by saying, well, my numbers are good, so I'm okay to eat like this, I'm okay to not exercise. I'm okay. The numbers don't necessarily in equate to good health. Does everybody understand that? Now, this is one, for those of you that have been coming for at least four years, I used to talk about this in every single doctor's report. This Avandia. Avandia was the drug that I got so sick of seeing but watching football. It was like it was on there every 20 minutes, the Avandia commercial. Avandia commercial for diabetes, Avandia commercial for diabetes. And then it was, it was quickly replaced, oh, well, I shouldn't say quickly, over a number of years, it was replaced with if you took Avandia, call lawyer whoever, you know. But we hear that about a lot of stuff. But Avandia, Avandia had a 43% increased risk of heart attack, a 64% increase of, of cardiac death versus people who were not treated. First, people weren't treated, so it was. It killed more than 80,000 people before they took it off the market. So 80,000 versus placebo, you know, or versus un, untreated or unmedicated. So this is one of those that was touted as a blockbuster, a, a blockbuster drug, the drug that was going to change, you know, diabetes. It was one of the biggest push drugs on the market, and this was the overall effect. If you watch, if you watch online, there's a drug company getting sued every single month for hundreds of millions of dollars for falsifying research for, and so why do I bring that up? Well, what, what's the likelihood that you're taking a drug that might be harming you more, and what do you get from it if they get sued? Nothing. You, you get the bad health, right? You get, you get the problem with it. And so, so we're not going to go through every single drug, but think about that. How many people had to take that to have 80,000 plus strokes and heart attacks and other issues um, in 10 years to get it off the market? So even with all those lawsuits. Now, we're going to separate these a little. So these are some of the most popular, um, these are some of the, the most popular drugs. I want to talk about the first four here to start out. So metformin, which we already talked about, and I'm not going to try and pronounce that, but everybody can see it. Um, these two drugs specifically, what they're designed to do is when your body releases insulin, they're designed to make your cells more sensitive. So basically to create the equivalent of creating more receptors. That's what these drugs do. That's why it's the first one, because it doesn't mess with your pancreas. It doesn't mess with your insulin production. It creates a sensitivity. So that's why it's a, it has a lower side effect. One of the scarier things, too, is I've, I've had multiple people come in that were put on metformin to lose weight. Now, now how long is that going to last for? Think about that. Now, these other two, these next two are these classes. So there's a ton of different names for the drugs in these classes. So these are the... The, um, that's why we're not going into them as much. But the other thing that you do, diabetes drugs do, is they will, um, what they'll do is they'll increase insulin production by your pancreas. So instead of you injecting insulin, they increase the production. So they're going to force. Now, what happens to an organ that's, that's overworked over a long period of time? Wears out, right? It wears out. So if it's overworked off long enough, this is that, then why after, after the insulin um, your body makes a bunch of insulin, your pancreas will actually start to wear out, and that's why people start having to inject, is because your pancreas won't make enough 
to get with the amount of insulin resistance that's there. Now, the cells that make it in your pancreas are called your beta cells. They, again, the positive side of this is they can regenerate. So beta cells can regenerate, which means that if your body's not producing enough insulin, if you, starve your, if you starve your body of sugar or carbs for a long enough period of time, the beta cells will turn on and, and the organ can repair. It's the beautiful thing about how resilient your body can be is that it can repair. Now these other, these other ones, the reason why I didn't talk about them as much, these are helper drugs. So when these ones aren't working as well, these help or stimulate production or increase sensitivity, one or the other. So those are the main ways. They're always working on insulin production, insulin sensitivity. Insulin production, insulin sensitivity. So if you want to talk about how do you get your body healthy, you either um, allow the insulin or your body to not need to produce as much insulin, or you starve it so you create more insulin sensitivity. These are the two ways to do it. Now I will tell you, here's the difference, the difference between consuming fruit with sugar in it or something like that and consuming processed food. One of the big things that are how fast you absorb it. So for instance, fiber versus simple sugars versus complex carbs. The more complex it is, it is true that you'll um, absorb it um, less fast. Also, when we talk about eating healthier fat or healthier meals, the reason why we talk about lower carbs and, and higher healthy fats is fats also slow down the absorption of carbohydrates into your body. So if you, if you consumed, if you um, took a handful of jelly beans, how much fat's in a jelly bean? None. They actually advertise 100% fat free like it's healthy. <laughs> You know, so if you, take, if you take a handful of jelly beans, throw them into your mouth, chew them, that's instant sugar with no buffer. Um, at the most, even with the, the other chemical um, gelatins and things in there, it will be out of your stomach within 30 minutes. It will be through your bloodstream very, very fast. Now, when you eat a meal, and you eat a meal that has um, proteins and fats with it, or even if you eat, um, again, a complex carbohydrate or a piece of fruit that has the fiber in, and eat the eat the skin or something like that, it slows the absorption rate. It can be as slow as an hour and a half, so it can cut the absorption rate um, by three times just by putting it in with healthier other foods. Um, in that, again, in, in the video that I hope you watch later, um, it, shows that, it shows that eating fat does not spike your blood sugar at all. You know, so there's, there's simple carbs, which spike it very quickly. There's complex carbs that spike it like this, and then there's fat, which spikes it like this. Does that make sense? So again, the more, the more um, processed your food, the more likely you are to have your blood sugar spike. So, um, and that's pretty simple, but it's also big business. It, it kind of drives me crazy that people can put, um, you know, supported by the Diabe American Diabetes Association. You know, that's a bought for a label. There's no, there's no requirement behind that. And there's these huge, you know, diabetes, gluten-free, all these different supplies. So what happens over time? So if insulin resistance comes first, then prediabetes, then diabetes, well, insulin resistance is probably, of the six factors for having a heart attack, blood pressure, cholesterol, they, they, they associate insulin resistance as the highest of the six for, for your risk of um, heart attack. All right, so again, conventional nutrition is either, um, is either moderate carb um, and low fat, which, which, decrease, which speeds up absorption, or, um, or sugar-free, right? Anybody seen sugar-free diet, you know? So think about this. So diet, diet pop, when you drink, if you drink a Diet Coke versus regular Coke, your insulin, act, your insulin actually goes up more with diet than regular. Now, why, why does that happen? Well, with regular, it, it goes up and then it grabs the sugar and it starts to absorb it, so then your body starts to pull the insulin out. With diet, because it's a sugar molecule with a chemical added, the, the body thinks that there's sugar, so your pancreas continues to dump insulin into your blood, but then there's no actual sugar there, so what happens? It makes you hungry. It makes you crave sugar, which actually they've shown that people tend to eat more that drink diet and it throws off your insulin sensitivities because your pancreas is constantly pumping it out and this is this is the problem with the diet thing so risk factors um, risk factors we've covered quite a bit um, now this for anybody taking note this was the video that I was showing you so and we will have it playing at the office but for anybody taking notes if, if you want to watch this this is a um, this is an obese it's a TED talk which are one of my favorite types of talks 
but Sarah is, a, is, is a, considered an obesity doctor, but her primary thing is how to reverse type 2 diabetes, and she covers it. It's 18 minutes long. So if you, t if you write that name down and just type in reversing type 2 diabetes, you can have it on your phone. You can have it, uh, you can have it wherever. You can listen to it on your drive home, you know, but it's, it's very good. Um, so like I said, we'll be playing it at the office, so it'll be written up there if you didn't have a pen um, for this. Good. All right, so let's talk about a couple of these studies. So what I'm talking about is changing, changing your, um, so this, this, this study, this um, Diabetologia, this is on the, the National Institute of Health's website. So it's, it's, on, it's not this little thing, but it's on the National Institute of Health that followed people over eight weeks who went on, on a, a very low carb, high healthy fat diet, um, and and increased their intensity and their exercise. And all, all the people in that study had been, had been diagnosed or undiagnosed with their type 2 at the end of the eight weeks. So again, smaller study. I don't, they don't really go into each person how long they had it or any of those things. But I will tell you, it's, it's on the National Institute of Health. If you type in that word, you can find it online very easily. Um, and they've shown that blood sugar can change in as short as um, one week. And again, the study was to look at the beta cells in the pancreas that they can turn back on. Um, another colleague of ours, Dr. Fred Roberto in Atlanta, um, studied the, the association with an improved nerve function and um, diabetes numbers. Now again, what am I saying? Can you, can you eat terrible, not exercise, and have your diabetes go away just if you get adjusted? Maybe, but probably not. You know. um, but is keeping your neurology clear to help your body function better, or respond better, a good idea? Of course. So. Um, so as we, as we look at this now, Dr. Kyle, I said this isn't an insulin disease, but insul understanding how your body produces too much insulin is important. So Dr. Kyle is going to come up and talk about the science of, of that. Um, one last note on this. I was thinking of ways to, to describe this as I try to explain it to even people in my own family. My brother-in-law, when he was dating my sister, was a Cutco salesman for a year. So Cutco salesmen go door to door. They sell knives. It's a good job for college kids. Learned a lot of good skills. They've been married for seven years, so obviously it wasn't that big of a turnoff. Um, but as you can imagine, every time we get together now and there's a meal, we kind of give them some jokes and some prodding about it. Insulin is essentially the door-to-door -door salesman that carries sugar into your body, carries sugar into your home, the product you need. So imagine now as I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about sugar and the various forms of sugar, where it's hidden in your diet, things like that. What I'm talking about is not only avoiding sugar and, and insulin resistance, but I'm trying to keep salesmen off your front doorstep. Sound good? And imagine these are really good salesmen. So not only are they persistent, they're there constantly, but they start to disguise themselves. They change their costumes, their voices. They're trying to trick you with new products. That's exactly what happens in your food by the producers and the marketers of these things because sugar activates your sweet tooth. It makes you buy more food. It's very nutrient light, so it, it, you never get full, so you keep eating more. This is a great product if you're trying to sell food, but it's terrible for your health. So starting off, of course, we know that the most direct thing with diabetes is sugar, of course, and it, how it affects insulin and leptin hormones in your body. How the five essentials tie into this, number one, maximize mind, of course. The first thing is to know that this is treatable. This is manageable. Depending on the, the different types that you have that Dr. Jared's gone through, there's a lot of misinformation about there that says that this is something that can't be helped. The truth is this is something that's very manageable. So number one is knowing those things. Number two I'm going to dive into just a minute here, going into the actual words to look for on the labels, things to, to avoid, things like that. So that's the mindset we need. Get adjusted. He touched on this, of course. The nerves to your pancreas has to function at 100% or your body's not going to be able to balance insulin and leptin properly. The muscles in your heart, in your body, that actually take up most of the insulin when it's, or sugar when it's being used properly, need to function properly so that your body is burning through as much sugar as it possibly can to, to make sure everything's functioning well. So get adjusted. Make sure your nervous system is functioning. Most everyone in this room does that. You're already taking huge steps to managing your diabetes or, or risk of diabetes. Eat a healthy diet. We're going to go through the advanced plan a little bit later here. Makes sense the more sugar you cut out. The more you eat healthy fats, healthy proteins, the more you're going to balance this naturally on top of having a functioning nervous system. Exercise. Exercise is the way that your body pulls that sugar out of the cells and uses it for its intended purpose, which is energy. So as your cells get packed in with sugar over time, 
The more you exercise, the more you burn it off. Your leptin hormone comes to ba back in balance with your insulin. This is how you're actually meant to do this. So the more you get up and move around and even start just simply walking, the better it's going to be. And of course, we're going to talk a little bit about avoiding and eliminating toxic chemicals and sources of sugar that spike. Now, diabetes, nutrition as a whole, some very basic things. And if you've been to a, a Shop with the Doc event, some of these are going to sound very familiar to you. How to read labels, how to actually understand what you're putting into your body. Number one, whole foods. Sugar is sugar is sugar, no matter if it comes from a fruit or high fructose corn syrup. But like Dr. Jared said, when that food is actually paired with things like fiber and fats and, carbo and other carbohydrates, your body doesn't absorb it as quickly. It dispenses out the glycemic load on your body. So when you eat whole foods, you're getting all those other macronutrients with it, which helps your body manage the sugar that's good put in. So a lot of things like, I'll talk about juice in a little bit, that's just a pure condensed version of sugar. You're not getting all the benefits that, that would help your body naturally. As close to the source as possible. It's a wonderful time of year in this part of the country because we have farmers markets now. You get the chance to meet the growers, the farmers, things like that. I encourage people to get out and utilize farmers market, but the closer you can get to a raw or a, a place where you know the source, the better you're gonna be. If you have an amazingly grown orange, organic, perfect soil, never touched pesticides, never touched herbicides, and that orange gets thrown into a bucket and mixed with every other garbage orange, it's not gonna make a difference when it comes to that bottle of orange juice that you're drinking. Higher fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate. Dr. Jared mentioned this. He's gonna go through the guidelines with the, um, with the advanced plan, how this relates to managing blood sugar. Eliminating sugars is a very big part of the advanced plan that will be gone through in detail. We also want to stress this is not a diet, it's a lifestyle. It's a way, and I know it's a kind of a cliche saying in the diet, diet lexicon, but it's a, way to, it's a way to approach it. This isn't something to do just for a few weeks. This is something that becomes a lifetime commitment. So how to become a, a diabetes label reader, how to read for sugar specifically. You want to look for minimal ingredients, the less the better. So the less, and the second point ties into that. Look for natural things, things you can read, things that have less than 13 syllables, and ides and owns and all those other things at the end. You want to avoid those things. So minimal ingredients goes back to that idea of whole foods and knowing the source. Um, and of course, we jokingly say, if you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't eat it. I'm going to add on to that one other one I saw recently. If it can outlive you, you shouldn't eat it. <laughs> so <laughs> specifically, we have the, the McDonald's out there. We've told this plenty of times. I bought that in August of 2013. It's the exact same food. It's never been covered in vacuum sealing or anything. It's sitting out there today. In the right circumstances, that's going to outlive us. Don't eat that. So don't eat it if it can outlive you. Uh, do try to buy foods without uh, labels at all. So fruits, vegetables, things like that goes without saying. Um, check every label and everything that you're buying. Sometimes products that you've been buying for years you get comfortable with and, and you overlook that. That's one of the biggest mistakes I found when we do the Shop with the Doc events is people go back and actually read what they're eating and they kind of get disappointed. Go back and reread old and new foods that you're eating. Um, and then make sure to just make the commitment. Put it back on the shelf. Don't allow yourself to, to fall into that trap um, or try and justify it to yourself. Once you know the truth, it should be that little bug in the back of your mind that makes it hard to, to go forward with it. Uh, don't worry too much about calories, fat grams, some of the other things that are on the labels. You know, we stress this because calories, if you have 100 calories from an apple or 100 calories from a Snickers bar, you, we know which one is healthier, right? So calories is just a way of measuring how much energy you theoretically have to use in your body in order to burn off the energy that's provided and that's not a great system and certainly not when you're looking at something like weight loss or, or balancing blood sugars. So they, they can be important in specific instances, but avoid those. You want to look at things like sugars, carbohydrates, um, and the types of fats, and most importantly, the words that, that are the ingredients. Um, don't buy ingredients. We talk about this a lot. Monosodium glutamate, MSG. It's a flavor enhancer. It serves no purpose other to enhance or embolden flavors, but it does terrible things to your neurology. Artificial sweeteners like sucralose, or, or goes by Splenda is the market name, aspartame or NutraSweet, Equal. Those are all sweeteners that, as Dr. Jared said, trick your body into believing it's eating sugar so it still releases the insulin, still causes the long-term damage. Show no signs. In fact, not one study has been done that shows that diet soda or artific artificially sweetened foods and, sh and drinks 
actually help you lose any weight because it still causes a glycemic index jump in your or glycemic load in your body. And the other danger is these are all chemicals that can pass through the blood-brain barrier and actually affect your neurology. They can directly affect the function of your brain, which is an extremely hard thing for most chemicals to do in your body. That's how powerful these can be. Avoid things that are hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated, refined, some of those key words that we've stressed over and over again. Um, don't be fooled by slick marketing, slick marketing schemes. Green labels do not always mean healthy, but they want you to think it does. We're going to go through here. There's actually 61 different names for sugar that the FDA allows, but you probably don't know most of them. And so if you read those, you may think they're OK, but they're not. Um, they're, one of the nice things about having a, a phone in most people's pockets is when you go grocery shopping, you actually have more resources in front of you than most people have had throughout all of history to understand what you're eating. So there's two things that, that I would recommend. Number one, if you're not sure what a food ingredient is, check it. You know, find a good reputable source and check exactly what it is to understand it. The glycemic index is something that you can easily pull up. It's a standardized, so no matter what source you get it from, you're going to get the same number. Glycemic index is actually going to tell you how much and how quickly a certain type of food affects the blood sugar in your body, the release of insulin and blood sugar into your cells. Higher the number, the worse it is. So pure glucose or pure sugar is 100. You want it to be down lower from there or you want it to be as low as possible to affect a glycemic index. So make sure you, you do a little bit of research. Check it on your phone, look it up. The other thing, and we talk about this again with the shop of the doc, if you don't understand, when you look at the ingredients, the labels as they're, as they're labeled, the more common ingredients are labeled first and it goes down the line. So the first has the highest concentration in that food, and then as it goes farther down, that's less and less. So understand not just where it's at but, or what's in there, but what actually is it is in the order of the food that you're eating. So let's talk about some hidden sugars, things that most people don't think is, is actually a source but really is. One third of the hidden sugars come from soft drinks. I don't think anyone's going to stand here and argue that, that sugar or soda specifically is full of sugar and bad, but most people don't realize how bad it is. Or even now there's big, a big movement toward like gourmet sodas, so we think they're healthier, but in reality, they're still full of sugar. So not to be something to fool with marketing. Two thirds, though, come from things that we probably don't realize, things you probably wouldn't realize unless you read the labels. So it's easy to avoid soda. It's not so easy to avoid ketchup. It's not so easy to avoid you know, different types of breads that we wouldn't think of. It's not as easy to avoid all these other things. But there's something you have to read. And, and I like ketchup specifically. Um, I use this one when I, when I specifically show people. Heinz is actually the, the one I use as well. Heinz is probably the most recognizable ketchup bottle and brand out there. Of the first five ingredients, two of those are high fructose corn syrup and fructo or high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup. So what they did was they took high fructose corn syrup, which is just a higher concentration, and corn syrup, which is a lower concentration of sugar, split it up into two chemicals so they didn't have to list as high on the list for you. So the first is tomato paste. If they did it, honestly, you'd probably look at sugar as the number two ingredient in ketchup. Um, and that's just one example. Fruit drinks, Gatorade. If you've been in the office, you've seen how much sugar can be in Gatorade or, or what we consider to be energy drinks. Um, yogurts, dairy products are loaded with extra sugar because they want it to be sweet. But like most things, people become a little bit more, more health conscious. They start to read articles online. They start to understand sugar is bad and the effects it has on things like diabetes, but also cardiovascular disease, cancer, as we, we've talked a lot about um, at previous talks. So they start to get smart in looking for things. And they don't want to see sugar on the label. So these marketers and the companies that make the food, they started to change what it was called. And so the FDA currently allows around 61 different names for sugar. The ones we're most familiar with, sucrose, high fructose corn syrup, corn syrup, you're probably going to know those. If it ends in an S, it's a good chance it's a sugar. What you probably don't know, though, and this is really common within the health food aisle, or the quote unquote health food aisle at stores, things like agave nectar, rice syrup, maple syrup, barley malt, evaporated cane juice. And here's one that I found that if anyone finds this, please, please bring it to the office, Florida crystals. I don't know where that came from, but that's a, a legally na loud name for sugar. I'd like to see it on a box if you find one. So Florida crystals, these are all different names that are allowed. And they're putting it on there not because they're trying to 
to tell you they're sugar, but because they're trying to fool you. So keep that in mind. These are some of the deceptive marketing practices um, that are out there. This is an article, and this is a, one that hits home for me. It's juice. Um, I have a, a young one at home, and so she's moving into solid foods and things like that. And so it's very easy to, to rely on um, fruit juices and things to put in a sippy cup for, but we don't allow that. And we get kind of looked at sideways when we tell our babysitter that. And, and even my parents, I had to have a kind of uh, sit down talk with them about never giving my daughter juice. And here's why. Juice is one of the, the most hidden and most deceptive forms of sugar that are out there. This is an article that was published actually about two, two and a half weeks ago, May 22nd in the LA Times. And it was in response to the American Academy of Pediatricians, which is the largest group of pediatricians in the country. They wrote what's called a statement paper. A statement paper is when a group of doctors or a group of professionals come out and they make an official statement for the record that needs to be referenced by their members. And in that statement paper, what they said is that, and this is a direct quote, fruit juice has no essential role in a healthy, balanced diet of children. This is what they recommend. And I would say even this is a little bit on the liberal side if you're really striving to keep your child as healthy as possible. If they're under a year, no juice at all, period. Just breast milk, just formula in extreme circumstances, only or no juice at all. If they're under the age of three, the maximum they should have is four ounces a day and it should be watered down. So think of a can of soda being 12 ounces, they're saying less than a third of that should be what a child drinks every day. I, I know how big sippy cups are, if you fill it with juice, you're getting about four times as much as that. If they're up to age six, six ounces a day. If you're up to age 18, eight ounces a day. So they're saying a, a fully active teenager in their teenage years should have no more than two thirds of a cup of, or two thirds of a can of soda of juice every day. And the reason is this, because when you have juice, like apple juice, fruit juice, uh, orange juice, whatever it might be, you're taking away all the fiber and so you're only getting the sugar and so it's like drinking liquid candy. In fact, most uh, glasses of orange juice, they said, are about two to four oranges worth of juice in there. And I don't know about you, I, I've tried, I, not in a while, because I'm past that stage in my life, but I tried, uh, I tried eating more than one orange at a time, or more than one apple. Have you ever tried that? You get through one and you feel good, and then about halfway through the second, maybe you're, you're ready to go for a nap. It's because all that fiber slows down your digestion. It sucks energy. And so your body naturally is not made to consume a lot of these really high fiber fruits. But when you take that away, you can drink as much as you want because you're essentially drinking candy. So when they advertise, like the commercial for, uh, I think it's Tropicana, where all the oranges jump into the bottle, <laughs> right? and they brag 16 oranges go into every bottle, that means you're consuming three to four in every glass that you have. Imagine having that much sugar put into your system and having it instantly affect your insulin levels. Anything other than 100% juice in this country must be labeled as a juice uh, cocktail, beverage, or drink. So if you see something that says it's a, it's a fruit punch cocktail, if it's an apple juice cocktail or apple, fruit, apple juice drink, that they're being up front, but they're, again, they're trying to hide that it's not 100% juice and it's added sugar put into it. The other danger with labeling sugar is currently there's no need for the companies to actually, or there's no requirement, I should say legally, for them to tell you how much is added sugar. So they can tell you that there's X amount of grams of sugar on this apple juice, but they don't need to tell you how much of that they just put in to make it sweeter than the actual apple juice itself. That's litigation that's still trying to go through, but for right now, you have no idea of knowing actually how much e uh, extra cane syrup they're just putting into your apple juice to make it taste better. Um, so something to keep mindful there as well. When you're drinking 100% apple juice, it does not mean that all the sugar in there is coming from apples. One more, one more graphic here to kind of drive that home. We have a bottle of Coca-Cola, Mott's apple juice, Tropicana. Coca-Cola, we're looking at eight ounces for each one of these. In the Coke, it's got 27 grams of sugar. The apple juice, 27.9. And in the orange juice, 22. So we think of how terrible this is, but this is right on par with it. Yeah. The other thing I want to touch on is we've been, I've been touching on sugar because this is specifically the blood sugar battle and diabetes. Um, if you've been in the office for any amount of time, you know that um, we talk a lot about acidity and how sugar is acidic and how it leads to specifically cancer. The blue numbers up here are acidity, lower is more acidic, red numbers are sugar. Coca-Cola has an acidity of 
Capri Sun is 3.3, Tropicana is 3.5. This one down here, which I don't know the label, it's 2.7. So they're literally drinking juices that are as acidic and as cancer, killing, or cancer causing and promoting as Coca-Cola and vinegar is only 2.9. So some of these drinks are as acidic as vinegar. Um, with that in mind, now that I've given you some of the tools, I hope, and some names and things to look out for, Dr. Jared's going to go through a more specific breakdown of how you can incorporate those tools into your tool set and actually go into the advanced plan. Whether you're a first timer or going back to it, resetting your insulin, hormone, leptins, he's going to walk you through the tools that are necessary to take that next step and make the commitment. If you've been to 10 talks, how many times have we talked about the advanced plan? All 10 talks, right? So how come we talk about all 10 talks? Advanced plan is good for weight loss. Advanced plan is good for diabetes reversal. Advanced plan is good for all this. So let's, let's go through this simply. Now, if, you, if you're like, well, hey, how do I do this better? Or I need a shopping list or whatever. At, and nearly every person in this room has all those tools in that blue book. So the blue cruise ship book has the last 50 pages, has um, shopping lists, example meal plans. Um, it has everything that you need to start this tomorrow if you wanted to. So know that coming in. And what are the, the basic changes for the advanced plan? You want to eliminate, so the advanced plan is something that you do for a period of time, usually at least two weeks. Um, you can do it for as long as you want, but like we were talking about for, the, for diabetes, um, they've shown studies everywhere from one to eight weeks specifically. Um, but for people that have been type 2 diabetic for a long time, they're saying it takes about eight weeks of really strict to give your body enough time to reverse it. So keep that, those timelines in mind. And these are, um, these are without cheat days, right? Or without vacation meals or whatever. So not that we don't all have those periodically, but if you're really trying to do this well, and the reason is the advanced plan was designed originally to lower the amount of insulin that your body produces. That's all it's designed for. And that's why the side effect is reduce heart disease risk, weight loss, all this other stuff. Um, so what do you do? Well, you eliminate all, 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 um, Moderate and high glycemic forms of sugar. So my, all moderate and high glycemic forms are going to be grains, um, sugars, including fruits and fruit juices, except for um, berries, grapefruit, and Granny Smith apples. Um, also, um, also a few of the vegetables like you know white starch potatoes and some of the starchier vegetables. But you're going to eliminate carbohydrates. You're going to moderate protein because one thing about protein, if you eat too much in one meal or one sitting, it turns into a form of sugar. It doesn't actually turn into sugar, so it doesn't do as much for the, the diabetic spike, but it does, um, it does affect your insulin sensitivity. So the, the average per meal um, is expected to be between 15 and 30 grams, mostly related to your body size and exercise amounts. So for a smaller person, less protein, and for somebody who doesn't work out as often, less protein, but 15 to 30 grams um, total, and then it, putting as much healthy fat into your body as possible. Now, if you, if you are sitting here, and, and I'm, I'm sure that's a percentage of people, and saying, well, what's a healthy fat, what's not? Again, either go back to your book, go back to the book that we talked about, or um, because food is such an important topic, um, every second or third talk is a recipe night. So how, how many people have been to recipe night before? Well, that's good. That's one. So if you've never been to recipe night, recipe night is the night that we cook. We cook a healthy meal. It's usually five to seven different courses or types. Everything from the breakfast smoothie that I recommend people start with all the way to a healthy dessert that can be you know, um, on the advanced plan. And so that, the next one of those is coming in July. So they're going to pass around sign-up sheets. for if, it's your, if you've never been to one, I'd strongly encourage you to go. Um, I know there's a lot of you that love to come to every one, and we love to see you at absolutely every single one. We always make the food different, and we try and make about 20 or 30% of the content different. But that's what's, that if you want to know way more about the food part, if you're not as much of a reader, whatever it is, come to, come to the recipe night um, next. But these are the three basic changes for that food. Um, also, if you want more recipes, if you want more of that kind of stuff, the green nutrition book down in the corner, that's a great one for more info on the foods and having more recipes, and on our website has more. Now, um, he, here's, here's if we're going to simplify, not talking about the individual foods in between, but here's the way I, if you're trying to, um, let's say, reverse type 2 diabetes or just your, your, um, your pre-diabetic and you want to get your blood sugar more under control, there's a couple things. So in my opinion, these would be the three main breakfast choices. One would be a smoothie. 
So, it, and if you've been to Recipe Night, you've seen smoothies. If you've been to any um, Patient Appreciation Day, we have, we have smoothies um, for all those things. So a smoothie, and what that includes of is a low glycemic fruit, berries of some kind usually, or green apples, um, some sort of vegetable, usually spinach, um, several healthy fats, coconut milk, almond milk, almonds, um, organic peanut butter, you know, a bunch of stuff that's healthy and fat, and then some sort of protein. Now, there are a few people in this room who probably put, you know, raw eggs or something in their smoothie, um, but I personally think it tastes a lot better with uh, whey protein or plant protein. So that's the blend. That's a healthy, full meal. Um, again, if you're trying to keep your blood sugar down, eating eggs and vegetables would be fine. Or the other thing that you can do, as long as your, your body's not too blood sugar sensitive, is you can, for a period of time, do what's called intermittent fasting. Many of you have heard um, talks about this, which would be to spend um, at least 12 hours without eating. So for instance, not eating from 7 to 7, or not eating from 8 to 8, or something like that. You can do intermittent fasting for up to 18 hours. So you could eat all your food in the in, in only a six-hour um, period, but that so another option if your if your blood sugar is not super sensitive would be to skip breakfast and just eat um, again or or wait till later to eat breakfast. Um, I think I personally think uh, for most people one of their meals a day should be a salad. Um, that's a great way to again to do this. And then lastly, um, kind of more of the classic. Um, I'll say you can have one of the more classic. American meals, which would be you know meat, vegetable, and and replace a starch with a healthier version, or use two different types of um, vegetables. But a lot of people like to have that you know piece of meat at the end of the day. All right. So to talk about artificial sweeteners, um, so I always struggled. I knew, I've known, I've talked about it at every shop with the doc um, that diet um, diet coke is linked to. Um, MS, it's linked to, it just this year, if you saw, I don't remember if it was April or May, but um, Diet Coke increased your heart attack and stroke risk three times more than most of the medications, two Diet Cokes or more a day. So it doesn't just affect your blood sugar, it affects a lot of this, but not just Diet Coke. Diet Coke just might be the worst. You know, it might be the worst out of all of them. It has, it has all this acid, it has, it's very acidic, um, it's, it's very bad for you, and it raises your, it raises your, um, insulin even though it doesn't affect your blood sugar and it's been linked to more weight gain than regular coke consumption. Um, but like I said, that's all the things that we already talked about. Insulin sensitivity um, and actually shown to increase your, your visceral body fat, which is a more dangerous type of body fat. So I want to talk about two, two um, supplements for a minute. One is I, um, these grass-fed proteins uh, or the plant proteins. So here's one more reason to, to use a better quality supplement. So most most protein powders that you're going to buy are either going to have a bunch of simple added sugar or they're going to be sweetened with artificial sweeteners. So both of them negatively affect your health while you're putting protein in to try and make this really healthy smoothie. So if you're going to consume a protein, I, quite frankly, I don't care if you take ours or not. You know, that's not the, that's not the point in talking about this. But the, the thing is, is that these are absorbable, usable. They have none of the increased... Um, bacteria and things that are in cheaper proteins, and they're sweetened with stevia. They're sweetened with vanilla or chocolate, and then they're sweetened with stevia. Now stevia and xylitol are two of the um, sugar substitutes that are much better for people. Now I say sugar substitutes because although artificial sweeteners are much worse, sugar is much worse, even stevia has been shown to increase your um, insulin sensitivity slightly. So again, it, it does, it's not like the, it's perfect, but it is an herb, so it's much, much, much better than any of the other options, and it doesn't have the cancer causing or the other things. Here's the other one that I like for energy. So again, for, for people with diabetes, one thing that um, you may or may not realize, you know why it's, it's common in certain countries to eat dessert with coffee? Anybody know why? It keeps your blood sugar more regulated. So how come when you eat dessert by itself, you spike and crash? If you eat dessert with coffee, you, you might go up, but you might have more energy, but it kind of lasts longer. So the ca what caffeine does is it raises your blood sugar, but it also puts a, more of a cap on it, so it keeps it at a more moderated um, level. It's still, even when you, if you just drink a cup of coffee in the morning with no food, it will raise your blood sugar usually into a pre-diabetic level to about 110 or 115, even though you haven't put any food in your body. Um, but again, with the dessert, it's going to go higher than that, but it's going to be easier for you to function after you eat it. So that's why it's common to have dessert and 
coffee or dessert and espresso or dessert and whatever. Now, if you, if you um, want more of an energy support, this is one of my favorites. I, I took it today. I took it today at about 2 o'clock. Um, so, so MaxFit is one of those um, that was originally developed when, when we first started working with the, the Olympic teams. Um, the, the USA wrestlers t were taking this three times a day. So they're taking it after every workout or every meal. Um, I don't think we quite need to do that, um, unless you're an Olympic caliber athlete or something. But what it does is it does a couple of things. One, it increases energy without doing the other things that caffeine or um, stimulants do because it's done with um, several herbs, ashwagandha, green coffee bean extract, which actually has no caffeine in it. Um, and so it's going to help you with to have a more sustained energy throughout the day. The other thing is it helps with um, it helps with because it has it helps with insulin insulin sensitivity. It helps with um, healthy weight or maintaining a healthier weight or with helping to lose weight. It also supports lowers your cortisol levels. It's been shown to lower the cortisol, which is your stress hormone. So if you work at a stressful job, if you have a physical thing, um, Max Fit will will actually lower that. And cortisol is the the belly fat hormone heard of that before. Cortisol raises your blood sugar. And why does it do that? Well, it does it because if you're running a marathon, your body would release cortisol to keep your blood sugar up so you continually have energy to run this real long distance. But now because of a higher stress environment without the physical need, cortisol tends to cause blood sugar to go up, but then it causes you to retain um, belly fat or body fat. So Max Fit's a great one for energy. It's good coffee replacement if somebody's looking for that. Um, now, let's talk about exercise. So, somebody said to me again today, you know, well, I, I walk a lot. You know, I, I can't, my blood sugar is not, I'm having trouble controlling my blood sugar and I walk a lot. Or we, we work out in the pool or something. And again, there's nothing wrong with those things. They're good exercise. But what they're showing is exercise is the only thing that will exclude insulin for um, getting sugar out of your bloodstream and into your cells. So the only time that you can get sugar out of your cells without affecting insulin sensitivity is while you're working out. It creates a bridge and allows more sugar to come in because you're burning faster. So exercise, specifically more intense exercise, is linked to helping with insulin sensitivity, helping to get your blood sugar down. And so um, for those people that like the slower workouts, if you're trying to affect your blood sugar, you really have to work out more intensely to get the better overall effect. Now there's a few things, and you can read these, so we won't go through, but over 3,000 people, again, um, impaired glucose tolerance exercise, far superior than the popular diabetes drug, metformin. So exercise worked better than metformin, three to one. You know, which again, tons of people get put on that. And so again, if you get put on metformin to lose weight, really it's going to be better there. Um, metabolic effect, again, short-term sprint intervals, um, pull, pull insulin, uh, you know, make you more insulin sensitive, create the gap. So sprints, intense exercise. Um, I mean, these are just study after study. So I put a few of them in here. I don't think we need to read each one. Also, exercise is shown to help with your A1C. Um, so many of you know, uh, for the last, I, I would say, what, probably three months, we've had max T3 or, or more intense workout classes at the office. They're, they're Tuesday at noon and Wednesday night at 7.15. When we go to the, the, newer, the new office, we should have more classes that you'll be able to get adjusted and then go. But for right now, we don't have... Um, that space or capability. We're also working with the Y to potentially use the Y that's right down the street from us to have a couple of Max C3 classes. But if you're interested in having someone help you with this, um, it's great groups both Tuesday and Wednesday, and you can come to the class or you can do it at home. Some people don't like to exercise around other people or don't like to go to the gym. We have DVDs where you just plug in the DVD and they show the different sizes. They show expert, intermediate, and beginner. And then online now, on top of that, they even have um, super beginner or something they're calling it. So it's, it's any size. Um, so to, to um, close here tonight, here's the different things to look at when you're talking about diabetes. First of all, deciding why. I know there was a few people in here tonight that I feel like um, came back just because they could feel their, um, what do you call that, their personal like angst to, to keep doing it starting to wane. 
You know, anybody ever have that? If they're around, if you're around five people eating donuts and you're eating a salad, anybody ever felt like I want to eat the donut? You know, sometimes you're just around people who are doing that, and so you really, if you're around that, you have to have your why. You know, you have to have your reason that you're going to be different, or you got to make sure you're not around the donut eaters while they're eating the donuts. You know, it's one or the other. Go, go see them 15 minutes later, whatever it is. Um, also, change, change the way that you think about it. Like I said, if, if literally the American expectation for diabetes is to take metformin till your body gets so resistant that you take insulin, insulin increases your body weight, causes heart disease, damages you, I mean, it's not a very good thought on how to manage your health. It's not, it's not like that is the best thing to do. And I think we all get that, but it's, it is easier to say, well, I can just take a bigger shot of insulin if I have a big piece of whatever. And, and I understand that, but keep think, think the way you're, you're working on that. Meals have to change and they have to change consistently. If you're trying to reverse it, it has to be strict. When you're not reversing, it doesn't have to be perfect. But the cool thing about your body is if you actually reverse the, if your body operates most of the time at a regular blood sugar, regular insulin, regular insulin sensitivity, if you have a vacation meal, it will spike and come down where if, you, if you're already insulin resistant, when it goes to spike, it doesn't come down and it lasts so much longer. That's the difference in how your body works. So by getting healthier, it actually allows you to, make, to have more of those things periodically, but you have to get it fixed first. Um, exercise is, is so linked to have, reversing type 2 diabetes or balancing your insulin, especially intense exercise. Toxicity can, can burn you out. You know, again, it can damage your insulin receptor. Your pancreas is an organ that's sensitive to toxicity. Another thing to consider that I didn't mention earlier, if you think of insulin as not being a drug just because your body makes it, external insulin acts as a drug on your body no different than any other drug. In fact, they've shown that um, while you're not necessarily guaranteed to you know, have kidney failure just because you're diabetic, roughly every 10 units of insulin that you're able to not take adds two to three years of life onto your kidneys for however long they were going to last at that current stage. So you think about what is that doing to your body? Your kidneys are one of the things that fail um, because of exposure to these medications. And when your kidneys start to fail, it's another reason why heart disease risk goes up because your kidneys are what filter your... So, all right, and, and obviously take care of your nerve system, having your spine, being in alignment, being healthy, having a strong immune system are all things that directly relate to health, and um, it's regardless of if you have a diagnosis or not. So upcoming events, Max T3 is an ongoing event. It happens every single week. Um, recipe night is in, is in July, and then the last Wednesday, the last Wednesday of um, June, we're gonna have an essential oils class. I've been getting a lot of questions on essential oils again. Um, we only do essential oils classes because we get so many questions on them. So if you use essential oils, if you have questions on using essential oils, we don't care where you get them from. If you want more information, come, come to the night, come to the talk. Um, and so that will be the last Wednesday in June. Okay? If you have any individual questions, come see me up front. Go stop and see Dr. Kyle, Dr. Alex. Um, supplements are always discounted tonight, as I think most of you know. And so I uh, hope to see you again at the next event. Have a great night.